Welcome to Noble Warrior. My name is CK Lin. Noble Warriors where I interview entrepreneurs, leaders about how they move from the first mountain of achievement to the second mountain of purpose and legacy, such that you can find your own higher purpose, clarify your own vision, and express your own voice in meaningful ways. Now, if you have any friends who are on this journey, who could use a little bit more help to take that leap of faith, go ahead and share this episode with them. I really thank you for it. My next guest is Mitch DeArmond. He has had 30 years of working with teenage boys. He is a former founder of Young Men's Ultimate Weekend, serving over a thousand young men. He is the co-founder of men 2 menorg an initiation event for men who are looking for the strength that comes with associating with other great men. He is super passionate about young men's work and men's work. Please welcome Mitch DeArmond. Good afternoon. Awesome, Mitch. Yeah. Let me just say first, uh, when I first met you, we were at a leadership retreat and you started speaking very passionate about uh, what you stand for and your passion to men's work is palpable. Can you tell us why initiation is important for both young men and men? First, um, first of all, I'd like to say that um, the main thing why it's important is it's been done for thousands of years. So if we just trust legacy and history, we understand it's important. Secondly, I believe that there needs to be a demarcation point where we um, surrender our childhood attitude and desires and accept the social obligations that our culture um suggest that men should perform whether that be good manners or um going to work every day whichever it's going to be the, the culture decides but there's always been a, an attitude that men needed a place to say today's the day this is the beginning and let's go and, and i think that that those kind of phrases speak pretty strongly to men and also you know, in the natural sense of things, uh, females have a place in their lives where it marks they're no longer children. They start their menstrual cycle. They go into it. Boys don't have that. And so the culture is made up for that by having initiations. Because if you take the word initiation, it just means this is the beginning. It's, it starts now. And uh, when they go into an initiatory um, situation, what ends up happening is you learn the social, moral, philosophical obligations of, of being identified as a man in your culture. And so as those um, definitions have been altered and, and changed and ignored and, and just forgotten, um, we got a lot of young men and men wandering around kind of aimlessly just filling in, you know, a role of a provider without really having a connection to a much more serious social responsibility in the, in our presence in, in uh, walking down the street. Mm. That, you know, there's a way to walk down the street where you actually bring security to your neighborhood rather than you're just going somewhere. And, and mm. those are responsibilities of, of the men have always had. So let me ask you a follow up question. You know, you know me, I'm a believer, mm -hmm. right? I, I, I love men's work. I think it's deeply important. However, there was a point in my life where I didn't think gender, you know, masculine, feminine, these type of roles or, you know, as a little bit too restrictive when mm -hmm. I was younger. Whereas now today I feel it as a, as a very liberating, you know, expression of who I am as a spiritual being, right? My masculine essence. So to those who are thinking about, well, you know, men's work, women's work is a little bit too, you know, gender roles, this type of, you know, restrictive, we're, we're, we're beyond that 2022. How would you respond to that, you know, that skepticism or that questioning of, uh, hey, this is a little bit too old school, like too. Yeah, I, well, I, I, I would answer it like this. 
we haven't really gotten beyond it. What we've all we've done um, with the inclusion of other ways of identifying ourselves is that we've diluted all of them. We've just diluted them down into a conversation about something, but uh, people of other identifications, they don't have the rituals in place so that they feel solid in their identifications either. And, and so they're wandering and, and the masculine is wandering and the feminine is, seems to be the most certain of all of us. And, and so um, it hasn't really gotten anywhere yet as far as transformation into a consciousness that is helping us all cohabitate better. It's not really built into a social structure that is functioning well. And so um, as, as the different identifications decide how they're going to uh, create their identity and, and validate it as a substantial presence in the social network, um, we don't want to lose the ones that are already there because they're basically the foundation of it. Yeah. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. I mean, the way I think about it, for me, I'm very Taoist, right? This is the noble warrior. So I'm very Taoist, the yin, the yang, you know, finding the harmony in the middle. For me, it's, it's, it's um, let's see, the responsibility of oneself to find that harmony in the middle. As you said, you know, how do you find the the identity that substantiate, that, that, that sustain who you are the most? Mm -hmm. And whether it's gender or roles or uh, different roles, positions that you play in life, I don't actually personally care how people find their harmony. I just want them to find their harmony because when everyone's harmonizing, guess what? Collectively, society is a much, much better place. So, you know, if I here's what I will say to younger CKs, hey, before you dismiss it, try it on first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then... And just see how he feels. If you don't like it, great. Then you want to try on something other, some other philosophy, great. Do that too. Like yeah. I don't, I'm not attached to, you know, them uh, embracing, quote unquote, masculine principles or things like that. I really don't. Just find the principles that, you know, that feels good inside for you. That's the way I would advise younger CK. Yeah, and what I what I've taught my my boys is before you change the directions, you should know the directions mm -hmm. It's like, once you know the directions, and if you want to build the bicycle a different way than the directions say, then go ahead and build it, but know the directions first. So you have a foundation that you can always find a way to end up with a bicycle. If that's what it comes down to, like you're kind of stuck with it. Uh, this is all only going to be a bike <laughs> and you're left that way. But if you don't know, you don't know. And if we don't maintain those things in our society, then uh, we're going to continue with this just pointing why the other thing is the most wrong thing and nobody's going and here's how you do it mm. we don't we don't have a real uh you know a real part of our society that says anybody is willing to say this is the way it's done it's it's left and, and this is i think a, a fault of not having a, cl a clear connection to our elders Mm. Is, is that um, the elders used to be the ones who established this is this is the way it's done this is how we do it and and they'll show you and you can go along and of course you can change whatever you want to do in, in at least in a lot of societies without any anything else but there was somebody that said here's ground zero and and I think that that's one of the obligations of of keeping our elders in place because you know the good elders that I know they don't say be like me mm. they don't got that going on they just go you know there there is such a thing as right and wrong and this is right and this is wrong mm -hmm. and you can go from there mm -hmm. so it, it's it's uh because it's a social structure that we're trying to live in not just uh validating the individual you know it's it's when you bring up the the yin and yang you know i, I know about the harmony within oneself and also, you know, I also have to have that with another person. So if I am, I'm married to, I've been married for 30 something years and, and my wife brings a lot of feminine to the, to the table. Well, if I don't, if I don't match that with the mutual masculine, then things are a little bit off, 
out of harmony mm -hmm. with the language right mm -hmm. it's like and, and it shows and it shows it's it's uh difficult to get along when it's that way when i'm being um in the same energy that she's being i'm being masculine she's being feminine we harmonize great there's a middle you know the phrase that you find in them there's a middle to that but if i'm out of whack or she's out of whack where the middle is on one side and and uh that does not have any balance to it the guest that i had on before you is rudy ronda is the founder of anywa and uh, the boa foundation and their whole mission of those two organization is to bring together elders from all over the world and spe uh, specifically from indigenous tribes mm -hmm. from the amazon and different places around the world and then have them uh, share the wisdom so it's perfect that you're talking about the importance of elders mm -hmm. yeah um well so I, I'll use younger CK because he's easy because uh, I know him and I don't think he'll mind me alluding to the younger CK so much. As a younger CK, I'm trained as a biomedical engineer. I'm very much an innovator. So I celebrate the modern advancement of technology and science. And I readily discard traditions and, and lineage and heritage because I thought I hey, am beyond. <laughs> Mm -hmm. want to know right but as i got older i was like oh, okay it's, it's don't th just throw it away actually harmonize yes. the past traditions and the wisdoms and see how we can use these new technologies to again find that harmony middle for the contextual the context and the problem that we face at 2022 and then moving forward that way so um what are some of the places that you know of Actually, no, you are a curator of bringing elder wisdom, not just yourself, but you curate environments, bring other elders in to help young men and also men in general. Can you speak a little bit more about how you do that? Well, it's first of all, you have to find brave men who are willing to speak up out loud that they stand for something. It's not a very popular position and it really makes you an easy target if you establish a position like uh, you were alluding to earlier about masculinity you know when you were young it was easy to discard the notions because that's what young people do and it's easy to do that but as you get older and you get a little bit more experience with life you can see the the problems that, that causes when you naively discard things that later on you might need because masculinity um, brings on things like initiative, the creativity that is dynamic in the work that you're doing um, comes from the masculine. Say more uh, about that. Actually, can you say, well, okay. So in, unpack in that? my version of um, the attitude is, Masculine is dynamic energy. Feminine is magnetic energy. So when mm -hmm. I'm operating in the feminine, I'm drawing energy towards myself. When I'm operating in the masculine, I'm going out into the world. I'm, I'm receiving information or putting information into the world. I'm creating something, putting it into the world. All of us, men and women, and have both. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it's knowing which one to use and when is the discipline not i'm this or i'm that we've we've all suffered the pains of being around or being the kind of people that have leaned to one side or the other too much and and that had to experience the suffering for ourselves that that causes mm -hmm. and, so, and so as we outgrow that as, from the time we're getting younger to the time we're getting older uh, we start going like, well, maybe I better pay attention to why they did things the way that they did. Not just throw it out because it's old fashioned or throw away the book because it's, you know, it's the book is only 500 years old. Let's throw that one away and write a new book. And and but probably the most harmful part of it is if we throw away everything old, where are we going to draw respect from? If we're going to put respect into the world, 
it hasn't been created yet in the new world. So where are you going to draw it from? When yeah. you say respect, can you say more about that? What do you mean by that? I mean, um, I mean, situations, things that are worthy of praise, worthy mm -hmm. of um, what is the word I'm thinking of? Reverence. Mm -hmm. It is to have a level of reverence for the existence of it. And, mm -hmm. and to the point where uh, we obligate ourselves to maintain it in some ways. So um, if we don't, if we discard the past, we have no place to to grab a hold of and project respect into the future. And I think we're seeing a very big price being paid for having given up too much of the past as we move forward. And and so our social systems, our schools, our our politicians, it doesn't matter where you look, people are not addressing each other with the type of uh, respect that I think human beings should get. You know, it's like for, for the hundreds of thousands of years, humans have been coming, getting to here. At some point, we should at least respect each other that we've made it this far, respect our own lineages, respect our own legacies, because uh, all of everything that came before us survived a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, before it became so easy like it is now, um they you know they went across oceans and they climbed mountains and and they spent their whole lives doing it and and if we cut ourselves off from the history of 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 how we've lived not how we have and probably some of it's avoided dying how we survived some things it's like well where are we going to get the dignity that it takes to like move forward in a in a dynamic and respectful way how are we going to get that information like we have enough people suffering from low self-esteem right now. Mm -hmm. Very common phrase. Everybody knows some way that, that you know, somebody's suffering from low self-esteem. Well, where do they get their esteem from? If they if they don't look back and go, you know, my great grandmother came across the ocean in a in a whatever kind of boat, it's like something to be proud of. That, that and proud of the fact that she endured it. She was tough, she was strong. And, and she endured this thing is like, where do I create the expectation for myself to survive? I just rely on my instincts that were come through nature. Well, we're not very connected with those kind of instincts anymore. Yeah. I mean, that's actually a really good point. Um, so I used to be that man that you talk about, right. Who struggles with insecurities and, you know, all these, you know, lack of confidence or lack of focus. Right. And, and it was a journey to actually reclaim my own inner sovereignty and to remember that just the number of sperms alone, I'm one out of 500 million. So I'm born a winner. Yeah, there you go. Right. Yeah. Not to mention 250,000 years of human history. That's, you know, I don't know. I can do math publicly, but uh, basically tens of thousands of the uh, ancestors mm -hmm. they're all winners so it's a yeah. family of winners they yeah. survive the wild they competed quote unquote competed right they they thrive rather you know out yeah. of all those circumstances however difficulties they may be and then here i am i'm standing on their shoulders yep right and then i'm not just this accidental happenstance from the universe like ta-da here i am no lineage no relations to anyone else this is at least for me this narrative is a very empowering narrative mm -hmm. the way I well, and, and, it, and it's culturally significant in our morality that we have obligate we have moral obligations to honor all of that came before us in order to perpetuate it in forward into the future and and or do we know the stories to tell the people to get to go to the future? You know, sometimes it's myth, sometimes it's metaphor. And and if without those without those stories that came from the past, what are we motivating with? Well, what what we seem to be motivating with in my limited vision is greed. Greed. Prosperity, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have more things than we can possibly stand. There's 
entire industries to store the stuff that we don't use. Yep. You know, I have five hammers and four of them are in a storage unit. Yep. It's and it's like that's greed. Mm-hmm. And then but it's mine. And and so that whole possession is, you know, no, they didn't come across the oceans and over the hills and through the valleys carrying too much stuff. Mm-hmm. That's not how they made it. They made it with you know the word sustainability, right? They made it with by sustaining themselves, bringing the right things, which is a level of intelligence that, you know, was well thought out, well planned, guesses of what they might come across, and preparation. Not just you walk out the door with your, and put the keys in the car and drive off, and then realize later you forgot your cell phone. It's like, oh, no, they, they had to sit down and prepare how they're going to make it for months and years in advance. That, that is a lot of intelligence that we're not accessing right now. So bring back to my question. You said finding brave men who mm -hmm. is willing to share their perspective, however strong their strong beliefs may be. How, how do you go about finding them? Well, first of all, you got to be social. Okay. That helps. And, and, and I think we, we put way too much on it because a lot of times uh, you just got to say hello. I was, I was in a coffee shop in Escondido, California. And this group of old guys, I mean, older than me, old guys. So when I looked at them, I went, these guys are old. <laughs> and they were and they were way too loud for the little coffee shop and way too boisterous. And one guy comes in, he's got bandages on his head and the other guy's got a walker and another guy's got an air tank he's pulling behind him and these guys are just having a blast together and i, I so i went up to him and said what are you guys doing and they go what do you mean we're we're just socializing we've been friends for 50 years wow and and this is of us this is who's still alive mm. and they were all ex pacific coast baseball players mm. And and finding and like, why do you get together? He goes so that we can get along with the rest of our lives. Mm. So these are old guys who don't do men's work, who just came out of the professional original professional sports days, and somehow inside of them, they knew that they needed to hang together and enjoy themselves together, so they could go and deal with all of the other things. And for them, at their age, it was like cancer, high blood pressure, you know, all that stuff. And they really knew that they had to be alive and to be together. And, and so going around and finding those kind of guys meant that I had to get out of my little world of, oh, my God, are they going to be upset if I go talk to them? I mean, how many times do we not say hello when we walk by a person? Mm. When you're walking down the streets of Los Angeles or, Escond or Escondido, how many, how many people do you walk by and you don't even say hello? or good day, just a basic social grace that probably not very far in your past, your relatives did. It could be mm -hmm. just a nod of the head. So getting beyond this individuality and with a stronger component of we're obligated to socialize, not be individuals. You're already an individual. You don't need to prove it. We can see you. And, and, and what ends up happening is we dilute ourselves with all of these definitions of ourselves. We actually dilute our identity the more things we put on it. So instead of just, it's real easy to go, I'm a man. There's only one thing to consider. It's like, but then when I start putting in ethnicity and culture and, and rel relations in the past, my ancestry and, and all of that stuff, all of a sudden, I'm diluting down the person that you're seeing right in front of you in the dialogue. It may deepen me personally to know all those things, but to socialize, a lot of that information isn't necessary. Mm -hmm. All I need to do is be disciplined by what I would call social grace. Be polite. I mean, when is how, how often do you hear that word? Be polite. Be kind. Be respectful when you address other people. It doesn't matter who they are. 
It matters. It shows who you are. Mm-hmm. So, so having a set of uh, moral or ethical training, which should start early to the, and the training should be, here's how you socialize in our society. And, and not um, just for personal achievement because personal achievement is going to, going to change over time. You know, like at one point you were motivated to be, to be, to achieve some things and now you're motivated to achieve other things, but that does not devoid me of the responsibility of being respectful to others. How, you know, I was raised in in a generation, how you uh, treat others, was more important than how you treat yourself yeah and right now there in the psychotherapeutic movement of things there's a there's these other memes that are being generated that i think if we look at them more deeply and don't just have feelings about them um there's some answers in it like you can't love somebody else until you love yourself it's a pretty common thing to say well if you don't do it for yourself you can't do it for others it's like, is that true? A child who has no identity knows how to love. And you're going to tell me now as an adult, I can't love anybody until I love myself. Well, evidence says that that's not true. All it's done is, is give me permission to be more self-centered, more selfish. Mm. And what ends up happening is, and now we have, you know, in the last couple of years, it's been, we've all gone through some pretty intense narcissistic training it's, a, it's become a very, very popular word, right? Well, we train people into it with this idea of individuality. I got to take care of me first. You know, I, I hang around some, one of their things is, I hang around some people, one of their things is, you know, you got to put the face like an airplane when an airplane goes up. You got to put mm-hmm. the face mask over yourself mm-hmm. before you do your little children that are with you. Yeah. It's that's like, what they say. that's what they say. But, you know, I don't think that whoever wrote that one was a parent. Hmm. A, a, a parent is going to try to make sure that their children survive. And and the amount of discipline it takes to practice putting yourself before your kids is, um, I haven't done it yet. Mm. I haven't been able to put myself before my children. Are you always this way? Am I always this way? Yeah. Selfless as in other first before. I, well, I, think, I think it's a part of nature. Actually, mm. I, I, I don't think it's something that a, a human who is, who is, you know, the word authentic, okay. well, to, be, to be authentically human is, you know, you have to take care of the future. You have to take care of these little ones that need to survive. Oh, I don't mean your kids. I mean, just in general. Have I always mm. been this way? Until yeah. I, when I was mm. younger, no. When, when I was, you know, it's it's the same thing that you were talking. When you were younger, you thought a certain way, discard certain things. And, and it really, you know, sheds the skin of being a child into being an autonomous or independent being. And then when you deal with the loneliness of that, you have to start connecting with other people. And you start and you start practicing other things. You know, in in schools and stuff, it's, you know, in an elementary school, we are taught to be considerate of our friends. You know, be considerate of others. Too. How is it going to affect the other person? We we weren't taught. How does that affect you? We weren't asked questions like that. We were taught mm. how are you affecting them, which is really the measurement of power. Say more about that. What do you mean? Well, when you can take responsibility for the impact you're having, not just have an impact. You can take the responsibility of, of intention. I know I want to have an impact. Here's what I'm going to do to have the impact. Here's uh, the expected results of the impact that I'm having. And here's what I want done with those results. Am I willing to sit back and consider all of those things prior to me just jumping in? Am I willing to make a plan? Am I willing to try to get as honest as I can with myself? that I do have intentions because that's an adult attitude. That is the attitude that you start adopting once you're past the years of innocence. Everybody has an intention, everybody, all the time. 
Everybody has a purpose all the time. Or they, can they be honest with it? Because sometimes, when I was quite a bit younger anyway, not that much, but um, getting honest with what my purpose and intentions were was a little bit embarrassing how selfish I am. Mm. It was a little bit revealing about how much of everybody else I, I did not really care to connect with. I just wanted to have mine for my comfort and my pleasure and everybody else, you know, I'll be as polite as I need to be. Mm. But doing it as actually as a virtue of character, it took a while. You know, I'm, I'm, I'll just say well into my 30s. So let me ask you this question, because you started this Young Men's Weekend, right? Help a mm -hmm. thousand plus young men going through their initiation. First of all, awesome. I wish such initiation was there, or at least I found out about it when I was younger. I, I do this uh, mental stimulation a lot, uh, or not stimulation, simulation a lot in my head. How would I be as to, as I am today facing my 14 and 15 year old self? I'll probably slap that guy about a, a little bit. <laughs> Just the level of entitlement and arrogance as a 14 year old would, right? And yet, so, so I'm going to make my point. You created a weekend surrounding yourself with a thousand... <laughs> 14, 15, yeah. I remember, uh, teenager, you know, boys, uh, that's admirable from mm -hmm. just that capacity to be with, I remember when I was 14, 15, what I was thinking, like your capacity to be with that, that that's admirable in itself. Can you say a little bit more about the inception of that idea? Why? Are you so passionate about, you know, 30 plus years, young men's, you know, initiation? Why are you so passionate about it? Because here's what, here's what I know. Here's what I know is that it's, it, when we talk about it, it sounds like a big deal, you know, because we have an idea about young people that has our media has motivated us to have. We think it's difficult. We think it's a pain in the rear end. We think that they're hard. And we think that we have a lot of thoughts we have about young people. But if you haven't been with a lot of young people, what do you know except for what the media has told you? Mm -hmm. So knowing that humans are just um, monkeys who can talk about themselves mm -hmm. is is... Young men will calm down as soon as an older man walks in the room and he doesn't have to say a word. So we have all these things. In, in the pre-1900s, you know, I looked up a lot of things. You know, I, I did some work with uh, looking up, reading Joseph Campbell mm -hmm. and, and, and Michael Gurian on developmental psychology. And, and what I found was um, there's a natural state of, of calmness that comes over young men when older men are around. It's not this imposition uh, domination thing. It's we walk in the room and they go like, oh, thank God somebody's in charge. Mm -hmm. They just do it. And so it's not as difficult as, as sometimes we get credit for, you know, we're getting in the trenches and all the ways that we glorify and glamorize ourselves for the work we're doing. I was, you know, I was in youth authority and doing some programs in California Youth Authority, and and these they would do their little intimidation, gangbang, thug thing. Oh, you know, you're a white guy and you're in here, and we're mostly not white guys and black and Hispanics, and there's white guys in there too. We'd ignore those guys, but um, but and they wanted they tried to do this intimidation thing. I just right. looked and go, nothing's gonna happen to me here. And they're like, what do you mean nothing's going to happen to you? I confused them. I go, because you guys are too busy hurting each other. Mm. Like, I'm the safest guy in the room. You guys you guys aren't looking to hurt me. You're looking to hurt each other to prove that you fit. You guys can't even compete over here. Don't do you any benefit to hurt me. <laughs> so they're like, well, you're right. And they all started getting along. Mm. Because they started taking responsibility for 
for what they were hurting each other for was for status. Mm -hmm. And and when there's when the top dog arrives, so to speak, the elder, well, you can't really compete in status anymore, which is what a lot of the competition is. A lot of the competition is the position of status, a position of prestige. Instead of like I'm the top dog, well, an elder comes walking in, and it, and it and it really doesn't matter what race the elder is. Doesn't matter if 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 it was some ninety year old person of of black black African American person who's walking in, I'm gonna calm down. I'm gonna look at him, going like, hmm. Let's check. Let's it's because it's it's a it's a like wow. Because there's so many stories in that. There's so much unknown in the elders that um, they used to say, you know, if you're lucky, they'll talk to you. Mm. you now elders always sit somewhere on the side, you know, leaning on their cane. And then sometimes they'll say something. Mm. And, 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 if you, and, and if you're smart, you'll listen. Because they'll tell you things that are coming coming to you in your life. You're going to have to face pretty soon. Because nobody's getting out of this thing without facing most of the same stuff. We're all going to face disease and illness and death, and 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 they they've already done it. Their experience is so far beyond, which is why they seem so wise, because they have all the experience. It's not a trick. You, you know, we sometimes try to, it's not a trick. It's like they've lived life, they've gone through things, so they know stuff. And so, you know, that's that's why I think the connection is so important is because people do not need to get themselves in as much suffering and as much pain as they get older as people people who are individuals suffer a lot. They suffer isolation, loneliness, sickness more often. And it's like, so keeping that lineage together, it's a healthier thing to do. That's why it's important because it's healthy. Mm-hmm. Not because it gives somebody identity. It gives somebody the ability to breathe. Literally, factually. So you mentor, well, not you individually, but your organization or your former organization has mentored over a thousand youth, right? Mm -hmm. So what are some of the top issues that, you know, that always shows up based on your personal experience that you have observed? What are some of the most common challenges, you know, in our I, modern I, days that shows up? I think there's a normal, a normal, a uh, developmental challenge of being recognized, mm -hmm. being seen. Um, I, I, a lot of uh, young men, because I've worked primarily with young men, um, they want to be heard. Uh, but what goes along with that, there's a, there's a bit of shyness in them because they don't want to embarrass themselves when they're being heard. Mm -hmm. And, and um, they want to be respected for what they're saying, what they're thinking. And, and if we don't take the time to listen to them, um, we, we can't teach them anything because we don't know where they're coming from. If we listen to them, we go like, oh, you know, most young men do not have intimate conversations with older men, whether it be their fathers, whether it be it, it's their our society is busy telling them what to do and, and putting containers around them so that they'll move in the direction we want them to move. And whoever knows what a young man wants besides food, because I mean, they're always eating, but, but it's like, what would, have you ever heard very many young men, especially men of less opportunity, mm -hmm. uh, even be in touch with wanting anything? Mm -hmm. Most men being providers by nature are more concerned with what they have to do. And, and, their, and their focus and skill set is so they can get the things done that they have to do. According to nature, according to biology, they have to do some things. And, and all those things get mutated in time, but because we have a lot, you know, we have groceries and things. They don't have to hunt every day. That, you know, that used to take up a lot of time. So there's there's the attention. 
<clears throat> there's the recognition. There is um, one of the things I think doesn't, they don't want to be embarrassed or humiliated. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if we adults have answers, they want to be told the answers, not peppered with, with interesting questions so we can pretend they're coming to their own answers. Wait, wait, back up one sentence. What do you mean? Say that again. Okay. They don't so, want that Socratic inquiry style. They don't like they, it. They don't. Yeah, they know. They don't really. If you have the answer. Just tell me the answer. If you don't have the answer, we can have a conversation about what the answer might be. But don't ask me questions while you're sitting over here with the answer because you're actually disrespecting them and talking down to them. You're, so, you're, you're me, revealing their inferiority. But let me do a gentle pushback there. Well, maybe okay. not so gentle. Okay. Look, slap it around. So, so in my mind, the ego wants answers, but mm -hmm. really what we want is wisdom. Okay. Wisdom is the ability to interpret new information coming in so you can drive your own answers, right? So for me, Socratic inquiry is a really powerful exercise because you don't, I, you know, through this exercise, whoever's receiving it doesn't just come up with the answer. They also are training the meta, the brain, the mind of how to arrive to the answer. So to me, it's hugely valuable as a recipient, even though it may not be pleasant to be put on the spot and reveal, oh, I actually don't know what the heck I'm talking about because hmm. it's very superficial, right? Right. By asking questions over and over, eventually you get to an end where it's like, I don't know why I believe that. Then like, oh, okay, great. For me, it's hugely valuable to know that, even though it's unpleasant. So what you're saying is they just want the answer they don't want to you know kind of well, go through the steps well if the, if they if the, if you give them the answer they still have to live life mm -hmm. so having knowledge isn't the key they got to go use the knowledge so part part of wisdom is your ability to use the information that you have All right not just have information right not just hoarding it yeah it's like here i'm an encyclopedia i can right. i can win at trivial pursuit that's right but it, but if I can't use the information, if I have a bunch of knowledge of things that's unusable in living my life, which is what a young person would be considering, how am I going to use this to get a date? How am I going to use this to get a job? How am I going to use this in the way that I function in the world? If you know that, tell them. The world will provide for them enough mysteries to keep going forward. But what mm -hmm. they'll have is a foundation of security because there's somebody who knows something and watching out for them. Not playing games with our intelligence, but going like, look, man, here's some things you need to know. Now go out and then, because knowledge doesn't, isn't really usable until you use it. Correct. So when they get out there, they can have all the knowledge in the world. And we've all met people like this where. Oh, I used to be one. Super uh, I, I understand that very, very well from personal experience. Yeah, like a, like get into a big argument over a long period of time and all you've done is wasted like three hours. Mm -hmm. Why well, used to do that and drink? Mm -hmm. Right? I could I could justify having that long dialogue of whatever and, and I'd end up really drunk at the end of it and mm -hmm. think I got something really valuable done. That was a really powerful conversation we had. It's like, well, mm -hmm. is, if nothing got done, is it? Mm -hmm. I feel smarter or I, or I feel dumber. It doesn't matter. We didn't do anything. We just talked. We just made noise while we drank. <clears throat> so, so they're going to get a chance, if they're lucky, to go out and independently approach their lives and have to recall the information. That's intelligence. So let me, let me follow up there because I'm not sure I agree with that point of view. And here's why. There's value in, so I'm a coach. This is mm -hmm. what I do. This is what you do too, right? You, you help people to uncover their own conscientious greatness, basically, right? To, to come to their own conclusion in something, to enlightenment in something. So, so this is a poignant conversation. Whoever's watching, this is a poignant conversation, okay? And that is this. The, again, I'm going to go down, go back to the ego. The ego wants answers. Mm-hmm. But the nuance here, what I'm hearing you say is 
you can give them the answers, but encourage them to go out and actually try the tool, try the the knowledge, you know, so that they can embody whatever they learn. And then if it works, great. If it doesn't work, then we can d- discern what worked, what didn't, what's missing. So we can internalize that versus, I think that's what you're saying, right? That is that is what I'm saying. Okay, great. I just, I, for someone who is undiscerning listening, they say, oh, Mitch say just give the answer and good well, luck the, to the young to the, the young kids, right? The danger of the ego, especially for people not well practiced in, in recognizing it, is this. The ego doesn't care about the truth. It cares about its own definition. The answer that it wants is, is becomes a solidified definition of something. It's very difficult to change the ego's perspective. Very difficult. It's hard to change our mind. When I think mm-hmm. a certain thing about somebody, it takes a little bit of experience to start thinking something differently about them. I got to get to know them. I got to see them do different things. Because you know, a lot of us have our prejudices that we that we have when we first look at somebody. Mm-hmm. And we believe that until we get good information that says we could believe something different. If the ego grabs a hold of that first impression, you know it's, you know why it's so important to leave a good first impression? Because the person's ego is going to grab a hold of it. And they may see you that way forever unless they get to and, and talk about you that way and talk to other people about you <laughs> that way. It's It's, you know, I look a particular way. Here's mm-hmm. how I look. Mm-hmm. Well, it fits into a lot of uh, people's perspective of what people who look like this are. Mm-hmm. Got tattoos, got a bald head, white dude, blah, blah, blah. Wherever you come from. Rides a motorcycle. Like, rides a motorcycle. Really good one, too. It's super <laughs> cool. <laughs> and it's loud too. It's one of those <laughs> yes. roll up your window when when you when you hear them coming behind you. You roll up your window, uh-huh. and, and there's certain things about that that people think about guys like that. Mm-hmm. And so, and it's very difficult for them to change their mind. It's very difficult. I, I actually and the, the best example I have around the motorcycle thing is I was riding my motorcycle down the highway up here in Northern California. And so a lady I worked with was in her car with her family and her kids were going like scary, scary biker guy. Right. And she was like, yeah, she was, she was co-signing the entire uh, mm. that they had going on in their car. And then they got next to me. I looked over and we recognized each other from work. Uh, we were working with homeless at the time mm. in downtown San Francisco. And she looks over, she goes, Oh, he's okay. That's just Mitch. Mm. Cause I, I'm a pretty happy go lucky mm-hmm. uh, guy. All the, a lot of the time I'm laughing a lot. I smile a lot. I joke around a lot because life is for me, life is too difficult not to. Mm-hmm. It's like, I, it's it, life is serious enough without me taking it too seriously. Mm-hmm. Like there's enough things I got to do. So, so getting out there, but, but it's the exact example of, Here's all these prejudices that we have. The ego is uh, held on to it because, and we get joy out of um, when the ego makes a shift. If, if we're a little more lighthearted, it, 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 there's a commercial on television for Mercedes Benz. And it shows all these bikers with their bandanas on and riding in their loud bikes. And they pull up next to the Mercedes Benz and all the bikers cower in, in fear. Oh, it's the Mercedes guys, and and it was a it was just a twist of, of a prejudice that became mm. humorous because everybody a lot of people I won't say everybody, but a lot of people who don't know bikers who don't know how many toy runs who don't know how many special events they put on who don't know how much money they contribute to charities a lot of think bikers are you know drug addicts and 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 dogs, <laughs> and there's there's a fair number of those don't you know I don't want to, I don't want to make light of the truth. There's some troublemakers out there, but in general, most guys on motorcycles aren't. They're just yeah. family guys going out for the weekend. It has nothing to do with what, how the ego grabs a hold of something and projects onto it based on some other belief that we have. Yeah. Um, the former CMO of um, chief marketing officer of Harley Davidson was on the podcast. 
Oh, nice. Yeah, we were talking about, uh, you know, similar sort of like who actually writes Harley Davidson and then what's the brand and, you know, all that stuff. This was a really fascinating conversation. Yeah. Um, but let's bring it back to transformation. I know you're huge on transformation and then we have just alluded to the mechanics of transformation, right? How do you shift someone's mindset? We, we talked about giving answers versus the, my, my verbiage is, is give them something to go out and try and experiment with it. Right. So that way they can get, um, subjective, uh, data set versus just some theoretical data set. Right. So yeah. what are some of the other mechanics of transformation that you've discovered after working with young men and adult men? I think one of the, um, Oh, before you start, I forgot to mention, why don't you define in your definition, what transformation means before you go into the mechanics of transformation. So uh, if, if I am, I think we're always going to transform. I'll say okay. that we're always going to do it with or without effort with or without effort life is the way life is and if mm -hmm. you walk forward into it and you do things every day and uh you don't just act like a reptile and walk up and down the same path every day um you're going to change you're going to come into new things your, your consciousness is going to be altered by your your multi experiences and as that is occurring you're transforming you're adapting you're making it easier or better, probably easier, because that's what evolution wants us to do is not make it so hard on ourselves and and have some prosperity so that we can be comfortable and it doesn't have to always be hard. And, and so, um, but intentional transformation. That's what I meant, yes. What is, uh, I think is very difficult mm. be, because uh, very few people have a crystal ball in what, how they need to be in 10 years. Mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of things happen in 10 years. And so from the time that you're 10 to 20, a lot of things happen. And you are going to be a different person at 20 than you were at 10. You have transformed. But are you prepared for what you need to be prepared for at 20? So I think the um, first responsibility is one of resiliency. You know, if, if you want to transform, you better learn how to be resilient. You better learn how to um, bounce back from failure. Because you're going to trip and you're going to fall and you're going to make mistakes. And if your ego is too involved with yourself, uh, you'll quit. Because, because as soon as you make a mistake, your definition changes. You know, it's like all the superhero movies and stuff become very popular mm -hmm. because very, and, and only recently have the superheroes in movies included failure. They're not always successful anymore. It's like at the end of the show, it's like something bad has happened and it didn't get fixed. That's new. Mm. And, 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 and so we're, we're, diminishing what was this idealistic heroism which a lot of people are motivated by through the ego to in order to transform when i get to this spot i'm going to be this way and and when i'm this way then i'm going to have i will have made it i will have made whatever it is well in the midst of that i mean there's some very transformative moments that are out of my control and and i don't and if you don't if you haven't disciplined yourself to practice a life of good character, going through those transformations can be, can leave you with a lot of damage, with a lot of trauma, because you have no character in order to hold yourself up to get through them. And, and character is what gets us, most of us through a lot of things. And so as I, as I go down, you know, if I told you this, so here I am, I'm living a life. I bought a house, big old house on the corner in a, in a up and coming suburb, um, got a great deal on it. Top of the world guy. Here I am. Now I've made it. Wife gets cancer. Mm -hmm. 
transformative. Mm-hmm. It's like, and, and the kind of character it takes to come out the other side with the same hope, with the same joy, with the same um, desire to move ahead. It takes a lot of character. And if you haven't practiced it before that time, you become a survivor, mm-hmm. which isn't the, the championship game. Mm-hmm. It's like, do you want to be identified as a survivor the rest of your life? Because to be identified as a survivor, you're being identified by loss. Mm-hmm. By victimization. And, yeah. And you've endured loss. Mm-hmm. Well, there, I guess there's some valiancy to that, but not a lot. Mm-hmm. Nothing I want to brag about. And I'd rather come through it on the other end with a big smile on my face going like oh hell yeah now let's move on and leave the past in the past Mm -hmm. way, i will not with a good character i will not carry forward a lot of post-traumatic stress with with a different attitude i'll perpetuate post-traumatic stress it's like oh so how are you going to get by through all that so the preparation work has to happen young we're kind of covering 8,000 things that we talked about earlier. So you come through <laughs> you come through initiation with the qualities of character that, that we're going to say men need to have in our society. So things happen, we get through the other end, and we can still anticipate and look at life with joy and be excited for transformation rather than my ego controlling me with apprehension to it. It's It's... The, the beauty of transformation is it may keep me from having a um, career. Sometimes careers aren't really transformative. They're just, but they're really safe. You know, I can predict it every single day. I'm going to get my paycheck. I'm going to do the thing. And I'll limit my life within what my career provides for me. Or am I going to risk it all and and go out and do this other thing. Well, without the assurance of security, there's a lot of transformation that occurs. And your ability to pay attention has to go up because you have to be present for opportunity. Am I present to see opportunity when it's available? And then do I have the courage, the desire, the strength to avail myself of those opportunities? If I, do, if I haven't built that character by then, I'm going to find out through that transformation whether I have it now. And most people find out that they don't. So let me do a quick recap. Okay. Uh, transformation, some of the key skills from your mm-hmm. perspective. One is resiliency, the ability to bounce back from failure. Mm-hmm. And the second is ability to pay attention. Mm-hmm. And as you're speaking, I'm also hearing this attitude towards overall life perspective. I'm seeing and I'm visualizing a cartoon that I saw uh, some time ago. I had actually collected. Basically, you know, this little girl is about to go into the jungle, and then you know, all her shadows are whispering to her, "Oh, don't go! You're gonna die! You're gonna hurt yourself!" and all these other things. And then, she, you know, the second or third frame, like she came out of the jungle. And then, you know, full of like hairs messed up, like knees scraped and like, you know, maybe arms a little crooked or whatever. And then she said, oh, that was hell of an adventure. That's that's the visual that I saw is just really treating life and as a, as a whole adventure. How can we make our life an expression of our inner joy, right? Keeping that optimism, keeping that fire alive. There's a reason why this uh, podcast is called Noble Warrior. Noble as in our highest self, highest character. Mm -hmm. And then warrior is that warrior spirit, right? The adventurer spirit, the striving, the the mastery to that, hence noble warrior. Yeah, and, and, and when I hear the term noble warrior, what it also goes in my mind is in maintaining a level of dignity and self respect as you go through it. Part of nobility Mm -hmm. is is you know these are hard times and and transformation is going to be difficult you you've got to you're going to be altered you're going to go through experiences they're not all going to be easy but can you maintain your social obligations of discipline and respect for others while you're going through it as you go through the jungle can you have reverence for the animals that are in there 
you better or they might kill you. Mm-hmm. See, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, so it's a, it's a very good um, title because it, it really, in my mind, it, it brings up everything that I really stand for is that, is that the quality of character of a person can be transcendent through a lot of our social situations, economy, you know, health, you know, a lot, those are the people that we recognize who maintain their dignity as they're going through whatever they got to go through, through life. I think mm-hmm. that's why there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, self discipline in a, in a lot of you know like martial arts. It's like yeah, it's really hard to maintain a level of dignity when somebody just hits you in the face, and you're expected to. Mm-hmm. It's part of the standard to not let your emotions get you so carried away that you make yourself uh, vulnerable. Okay. Let, let's actually talk about that a bit. Let me do a quick recap and let's talk about mm-hmm. the, the emotions part. Okay. So some key mechanics of transformation skills slash mechanics of transformation, um, resiliency, uh, one's own dignity, your ability to state noble and dignify as you go through adversity, your ability to pay attention and then self-discipline. Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Cool. Well, and I think in the going through adversity, we got to put courage in there. Say more about that. Well, as soon as as soon as you understand that adversity is on the horizon, you have to make a decision whether you're going to brave it out. Are you going to keep going forward? Because you know it's going to be difficult. It's like, do you have mm-hmm. the courage to do that? Do you have the the are you prepared? Are you internally strong enough? Are you mentally strong enough? And the answer for most of us is we don't know. Mm. Are you willing to go ahead anyway? That takes that's courage. I, I'm pretty sure I can make it. I got the heart for it. I'll do it. It's it's courage comes from the word heart. Mm. It's like, oh, the core is the heart. It's not the heart isn't this soft, gooey thing filled with with juicy emotions, the heart is this thing that is tough that keeps beating your whole life and gets you through everything. And and some of that stuff's been ch- turned around too. You know, like Richard the Lionhearted. Well, he was mm. he was known for his bravery, not for his you know romance novels that he that he talked about. So here's one distinction that I realized uh, very recently that if you think about transformation the mechanics of transformation let's say right there are tons of books that offer tactical things there are fewer books that offer strategies there are fewer books still that offer um principles there are fewer books still that really help people discern the identities right a la men's work you know this type of things that we talked about but at the at the foundation of it all in my mind is faith in one's own ability faith in one's place in the universe so a huge part i believe the root of the kind of work transformation is all of these things aside it gets down to the faith in oneself and one's place in the world in the universe if you don't have that as the root you can have the best of all the tactics the strategies the narratives and everything boom 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 and you can even have great results in life. You're not going to be very um, stable. Do mm-hmm. you have any comments about that? Well, yes, of course. Mm-hmm. Faith is also a transformative thing. Your faith transforms as you use it. You know, like you have faith that you can get something done. You go risk it. You take care of it. You get it done. Your faith deepens in yourself, in your abilities. That and that pushes you to the next thing, right? Because if you're an evolving creature, you're going to be looking at the next thing to okay, now what do I got to get myself into? I'm transformative now, I'm, I'm getting myself into things, I'm consciously, intentionally getting involved, and and so then I risk the next thing. And what you're risking is mostly your ego, mm-hmm. and, and and so you get in there and you do the next thing, and you keep on going, you keep on going, and and then you fail. And you got to go through the humiliation and the and the 
uh, discouragement of failing. And then you have another decision to make. Have, do you, have I gained enough faith yet to keep going? Or some of us, you know, we'll go and we'll go take a class at the local college or something to try to build our faith up in our ability to move forward. We'll take another course. We'll go to another event. We'll, we'll do something to strengthen ourselves to gain the courage to continue forward. And so faith is also a part of the, is, is a, I want to, I don't know how to say this, static and transformative quality. It, there's a foundation of faith, but that faith is always moving with the transformation. And, and, and I don't think that we, uh, take enough time and we you can, we can find it from our elders really is their faith is normally really deep and really strong and they don't sweat a whole lot of stuff. They, yeah. they, don't, they don't get as carried and concerned. Well, they have, they know why they've been through these things when, when we're younger and we have it, our, our faith is a little shaky. Sometimes it takes a little bit of faith and a little bit of egotism to get us to move forward. Mm -hmm. And at some point the ego gets slayed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and hopefully you have enough faith to not just cave in or surrender to a kind of a mundane average kind of thing. If you're a, if you're the person who's motivated by transformation, mm. I think there's the maintenance people of the world too, that, that we really need and are super important to keep us all grounded all the time. The people who stay home, do the work, mow the lawn, take care of business that give us a foundational, uh, structure to life that we always know there's this other thing that's not going to change on us i think that there's those people too that we need it's not all about adventure and, and going out there for some of us it seems to be but for others of us it, it needs not to be because they give we build faith from what they're doing too mm. sometimes so, we go there sometimes we're glad that they're there so we have a place to land when we when we crash yeah. So, so what I'm hearing, and I'm so appreciative of this conversation specifically about this part, where do you, uh, how do you dimensionalize faith and what you just pointed to, let me give it back to you what I heard. Okay. So one is ego, right? It could be bravado or posturing, right? Believing oneself, even though there's no evidence. One is, uh, you can borrow it from your elders, right? Their faith in you is so strong such that you like, okay, maybe because they believe in me, maybe I can do it and borrow oh, it from routines. You can, you know, because you have, have so, uh, you're so consistent with mowing the lawn or, you know, your daily disciplines or your physical exercises, and that's transferable into other dimensions or other areas of life as well. And then you can even have faith in, let's say uh, from experience, as you mentioned earlier, right? You, these elders just have been so well attuned uh, through the different adversities of life such that they can, they know that they're strong enough to get through future adversities as well. So they don't, they're not as fragile as someone who is two years old, as an example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That accurately reflect what you said. Yes. And I, but I, not sure I understand how you're using dimensional. Um, different cuts, right? How do you deconstruct different parts of faith, as an example? A la different parts of Mitch, I, right? Dimensional. I, I don't think that you can. I don't think it can happen. Say more about that. What do you I mean? don't think you can deconstruct faith. Faith is a creation. And it, and it perpetuates. Okay. And, and so um, you can see how it was built, but it keeps building. Mm -hmm. um, if it doesn't, then it, you become static. Mm -hmm. and, but you've still built yourself to the point of being static. Um, if, you've, if you've disciplined yourself and your character, you can maintain the static condition. If you haven't, then maybe you'll start falling apart and having to realize the truth about yourself isn't what you believed it was, and therefore the ego is de is deconstructing, not your faith. 
Well, the last three sentences was very abstract. Uh, could you simplify it a little bit <laughs> say, and say it again? Okay. So your experience is your experience. You're okay. growing in faith and confidence and, and as you're going because you're achieving certain things, you're getting through other things, you've endured some things. Yeah. So, and your faith is growing. Yes. That can't be taken away from you. Okay. You can't lose. You can't lose that. Okay. What you might lose is is your definition of what all of that means about you. That would be your ego deconstructing, not uh, your faith deconstructing. And if you can't distinguish yourself separate from your ego, you're going to be in trouble. I see. So hold on, and you just use a couple. Okay, in my mind, what you just said is. What happens, what happened? Mm -hmm. Those are facts. And then there are the stories and inter interpretations and narratives that your ego or whatever came up with. And those are very malleable. That's what I got so far. And then, yes. so this, what happened is what happened. This would not change, but the stories are very valuable. Um, not valuable, malleable, changeable. That's what I'm hearing. Yes? yes. Okay, cool. Continue, please. Well, I'm having an ADD moment because the, <laughs> the, the whole valuable part of it has got me because, like, I could start when I was younger. I I won a few championships at a few things, mm -hmm. different sports, whatever. For a period of time, that meant something about me personally, individually. Yes, I was a champion. And I had championship attitude. Yes, yes, yes. And then as I got older and I started to appreciate things a little differently, I realized that I had other coaches with me and there was players involved mm -hmm. and, and, and I had teammates and, and those were more the forefront of my consciousness, which got me closer to the truth of my experience, but it altered my ego. I was alter my ego as in I my story. I wasn't the champion. I was just part of a championship. Got it. The narrative shifted. Yes. Gotcha. Uh -huh. and, and so my ego, you know, I had to take a few steps back in humility to acknowledge that there was a whole social organism working for championships to occur. Yep. You know, even even with wrestling and 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 having coaches, I had to start giving coaches credit for my existence. This is this is this is where elders get forgotten. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's, there's very few ugly professional athletes that who don't acknowledge the guys who are the ugliest don't acknowledge their coaches and their coaching staff and the, and whatever sport it is, those guys, yep. those guys do not get a lot of, uh, respect. Uh, I, uh, so quick aside, I had Jeff Spencer, uh, former coach for Tiger Woods, Lance Armstrong, Bono, these, you know, extraordinary people. And uh, he made an interesting point. He said, if there is an elder who doesn't, you know, whose eyes isn't crooked or doesn't have a scar or, you know, who's too pretty, like he doesn't trust them. Right. <laughs> because, because he says, if you're truly an elder, like you have battle scars. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 you know, even, even in, in the modern dialogue, right. The, the young men, like to look at the old guys and call them OG original gangsters, uh -huh. you know, because they see the scars on us that we've got. It could be wrinkles in the face or, you know, whatever, a bruise, a bump, a dent, whatever it is. And, and, uh, and they start because those are all things that they know they're going to, they need to learn. Mm -hmm. I think that's beyond the, the modern. Um, I think it's a part of our, our psyche. That they recognize it not uh, just a, an average form of intelligence. They they look at they look at a you know if you see old animals, you can see you know oh god that elephant got attacked by a lion at some time. Look at that, and and look at he's still standing there, and and you kind of it's a little bit intimidating. You know, they say things like oh he's got old man strength. Mm. Have you ever heard that phrase? I have. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's got old man strength. There's there's a there's a after going through the battles, so to, metaphorically or, or literally enough, you get a different kind of strength that is intense. 
So, it's, so I have a follow-up question there. I, circling back to being a coach again, I know we're kind of meandering the place, but circling back, um, coaching younger generations. <clears throat> again, using younger CK as an example. So the younger CK is very arrogant, or was very arrogant, right? But it was hiding the, you know, his insecurities, his lack of knowledge. So therefore, the the posturing, the bravado. That's the truth of what was what, what what was so. So when you coach younger generations, young men or younger men, um, how do you discern the coachability? And as a as a way to help them, not for your ego, but really as a way to uh, catalyze their own growth and development. Well, I think that the the best quality that a good coach can have is be trustworthy that a good coach themselves are disciplined to the point where they're predictable they're they're easily understood and that becomes a more solid foundation for the young person to take risks they they'll risk themselves falling apart because they know that you won't so okay they, so they'll go out you know they'll go out on the field and they'll do their thing they'll try the thing you're suggesting because if they make a mistake, and it, and it really has a lot to do with, and this is true of parenting, if your emotional response isn't, promo isn't parallel to the circumstances that you're going in, um, like if you overreact to things, you become untrustworthy. Yeah. You know, there's no use crying over spilled milk. Really, mm -hmm. there is no use crying over spilled milk. Right. But I wasn't asking the question on the quality of the coach per se. I was mm -hmm. asking you being a coach observing the younger generations well because well, some of them may have the, the the bravado the posturing the arrogance even though they you know the, behind all that they still want to be coached right so so discerning and navigating that space how what do you do as a way to help these uh coaches that you have these young men that you coaches have. the uh well here's the discipline of being a coach you coach the sport not the person mm. you make sure as a coach that they get all of the attention and exhibit all of the skills that you're coaching mm. so whether they're arrogant or not isn't the coach's issue mm. if it doesn't uh have a negative impact on the rest of the team. If their arrogance and attitude is a negative impact on the team, then they don't belong there. Mm. And you have to have that conversation with them, that their position on the team is more important than their name. Mm -hmm. We need you to perform these skills. I trust and I'm going to show you how to do those skills. And if you do it better than anyone else, you're going to start. Not if you talk about it. You're going to be the starting lineup guy, and I'm going to coach the skill. Your your personality in that is well, trans it's transformative. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge what you just said a little bit. Okay, what you but you also talked about the importance of character. Mm -hmm. To me. It, Arrogance is an expression of one's character, right? Yeah. So to be a leader of their team, they must have great discernment and great discernment comes from character. So when they're arrogant, this shows to me as a coach that they're not of the highest discernment. You know what I mean? Yes. So, so yes, coach the mechanics, the sport, no problem. Mm -hmm. But who they are actually speaks way louder than the mechanics of the sport. Yes, I and I agree with everything you said. The, the element that needs to be included in that is this is a young person not developed. Mm. So them coming forward with all of this stuff is what they're coming forward with right now. I trust mm. in their transformation. And, and what really humbles the, the arrogant person is when they understand the responsibility of their position. It's like, 
So you can come in all arrogant and stuff, but you have a responsibility to the entire team to perform. Mm -hmm. Not talk about yourself, not tell everybody how great you are. You can do all that too. I don't care. It does, it, does, it does not, it's not going to get you to catch the ball. Mm -hmm. So if you don't perform at that level, then you are going to be humiliated. You are going to feel exposed and, and it will be the facts. Can I still treat that person with the same respect that I should? Because they're a person, even though they've gone through that, because they're not going to change because I tell them if you're shy we, we always kind of want to project onto the the more advanced quality people. But if you if you have shyness, if I tell you, look, you need to not be shy on this team, you need to be this, are you going to get over that shyness because I said so? So as you add other qualities to to the to that, like here's the responsibility that puts you in this place on the team. You can be the quarterback and you can be shy. But when you start doing the down set hike, 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 you need to be loud enough for the get for the wide receivers to hear it. If you can't do that, you can't play. There's consequences normal for the position based on your ability to fulfill responsibilities. And that shy person may be shy off the field. But on the field, they're making sure that all of their teammates are taken care of by communication. It, I don't have to worry about it. Be, or the arrogant guy is the same way. I don't have to worry about how arrogant he is. And most of the other players don't care anymore if he's in the end zone with the ball. Mm. They're going like, yeah, yeah, he's that way. And there he is right over there. We just won the game. I don't care. Mm. It, but if they don't get that they have a, a social responsibility in all of that, you could be arrogant and socially responsible. You can make sure your arrogance is more of an expression of yourself, not an expression against somebody else. Yeah, I see. So you're coaching them on the responsibility on the team, the functions of the team, and mm -hmm. their how they express that outside of that function. Uh, as a young man specifically, you don't quite coach them on those those expressions. You don't want to curtail their expressions, whatever that may be. Shy, arrogant, mm -hmm. doesn't matter. Because, because because in my view, the reason we have organized sports isn't for winning and losing. It's for social development. Mm -hmm. High level of aggression, rapid movement, high stress, and you still have to practice sportsmanship. And, and, in, and on the field, if you practice the discipline of sportsmanship, then that person learns how to be a social creature off the field. Mm-hmm. And, and so what, nobody's an individual, really. Humans are a social organism. Mm -hmm. and, and so when people are, are more individualized in their sports, if, there's, if it's a one-man sport like wrestling, um, how, how are you going to coach that person that? Well, wrestling has, is a two-fold thing. You're an individual on the mat, but you're contributing to a greater whole, to a team score. So actually, I have a, I have a follow-up question there to you. This is, is similar because <clears throat> you had mentioned courage earlier. Mm -hmm. How do you help someone to cultivate their courage? Because it's such a subtle, like it's such a subtle thing, right? How do you coach them to take more risk, to stretch their comfort zone, to lean into that punch when that punch is coming? You know what I mean? To not to like... You know, not to not what's the word I'm looking for? Not to, you know what I mean? Not not to uh, pull back. So, so here's a problem with our society now. We go way too fast. If if I'm going to teach somebody to have courage, I need time. I don't I don't go like okay on three courage, you know, snap your fingers. Cur no, it's like you got to give them repeated experience over and over again to the point where they begin to have success and then they have repeated success and then the mind the way the mind works will develop the quality of courage because it can trust itself its performance if you don't have repetition if you don't have uh time to 
make all the repetitions. You're not going to have the courage. And this is what practice is for. And and we don't we have very little practice going into life. We used to be able to practice going to school, but but schools aren't a social network like they used to be. Hmm. It reminds me of a boxing coach I had once because uh, my natural response when I first started learning boxing, I'm probably still the same way, is to when the punch comes, I would, you know, do this, right? Versus actually just hold my ground versus. So he said, you're being too scared of the punches coming your way. And then he started the tapping of just boxing gloves on my jaw super lightly. And then over time, bigger and bigger, heavier and heavier. Then eventually yeah. I get used to it. I'm like, oh, okay, this is not as bad. I don't have to be so scared of the punches coming per se. So effectively exposure therapy, right? There you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, and, and it's the it's same every, it's like when, when you have really little kids and they're practicing. I like to coach football because there's 10,000 things and the consequences are immediate. And, and, it takes them a, a while to get used to the pads will work. So, so like where it'd be a normal response, if somebody's going to hit you and you have no pads on that, you'd want to be covering up and on all that. Well, they take them a while to really, they realize that their, their pads become tools, not just to get a job done as much as something to protect them. And it, and it's, and it takes time. Mm. You know, in some cases it takes months. Mm. In some cases, it takes a couple of years. Mm -hmm. some, some kids, if you, when you get to be around the same young people over a period of a few years, you really get to see transformation mm -hmm. because their confidence level goes up. They trust their equipment. They, I mean, that's that was one of my big things is we always want to provide uh, equipment that they can trust because then they can focus on the game. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so... The security, you know, get providing as much security as we can so that the leaps aren't too big. And, and you know, we're, I think we're seeing a lot around the world anyway, the point where people don't even get the opportunity or time to to transition. So, and, and they're breaking down and and uh, but they got to do it because they're trying to because they actually know what it is they're trying to survive. You know, very few of us have get to have the example, and gratefully so, of if I fail, I die. You know, I might get hit. That's one thing. But if I fail, I die. And, and the motivation behind that is a much deeper place than most of what we're talking about. So in, in our modern times, so we've been using sports analogy to illustrate this. You mm -hmm. said that the importance of having the right tools mm -hmm. to to cultivate trust, cultivate faith, cultivate courage, right? In when in oneself, in your with your teammates, with the game, society as a whole, and so forth, right? So broaden that further. The the work that men to men does cultivate all of that, but in a different arena, different domain. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the tools that you have developed, found, curated, put together to offer courage faith in oneself community brotherhood right? so, so then so that people can thrive not just survive but thrive in 2022 so i me personally i don't go to the thriving spot with anyone that has mm -hmm. got to be their own personal motivation mm -hmm. so uh if they're willing to take responsibility for that um they can keep pushing themselves forward at man to man. What we, the maintenance part of, of life is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with the, the trustworthiness of men being there for each other, regardless of the conditions. So if you're just came back from the championship or if you just had a serious illness or if, or if any of those, everything in between men need to be together. If you need to rage or if you need to grieve, we need to we need to create environments where those things can go on so that you can leave those environments and go out and do the rest of the social life. Not um, pretend that you're going to be able to hold your mud after, you know, 
loved ones die, people are sick, yourself included, and and you have uh, established the men around you are trustworthy so that you can fall apart and your life won't fall apart. Mm. So that your as your ego gets destroyed by what life is going to do to it, while you're building your faith back up, there's other men around that are keeping an eye out for you so that all those other responsibilities that a good life has in it continue to get taken care of. And, and that, that takes a lot of, dis- you have to have disciplined men around you. So the standards of conduct have to be clear. Um, they have to be consistent so that there is uh, security in what you're doing. Um, so taking a response because it's a whole nother level of character when you decide that, yes, I'm an individual. Yes, I'm an adult. Yes, I'm all these things. I'm a businessman. I'm this, I'm that. And I'm also going to take responsibility for your life. I'm going to, I, you're on a, you're on a great path. You have this company, Noble Warrior. You're doing what you're doing. I want to support it. I'm going to show up on time because you're valuable to me. It's like, I'm going to make sure I'm going to try to say the very best things I can say on your show because your success is important to me. For the only reason, because you're a fellow man. Mm. You're a fellow man, and I want you to be as successful as you're capable of being, and I can show up for that. So I don't want to clown around too much. I want to, I don't want to, I do want to clown around a lot more than I do. <laughs> but but um, there, there's a presentation that's going on here that, uh, that um, I want to make sure that I give my very best for your success. And um, the coolest thing I think about human beings is if you do that for people, they'll do that. There's very few people that, you know, take the goodies and run. There's, there's a, I think there's an innate. Wait, wait, back up. There are very few people, what? That take the goodies and run. I don't know what that you means. Get, if you give them generosity, if you give them kindness, if you, if you give them respect, very few people don't pass that on. Mm, yeah. They yeah. don't just go like, yeah, I'm all that. They go like, oh, wow. I can be differently, different with the next guy. Years ago, there was the pay it forward movie. And mm-hmm. it's like, and, and as we continue to discipline ourselves so that what we contribute into each other's lives is at a higher resonance, at a higher level, um, that person starts contributing at a higher level to the next person. We're all connected whether we like it or not. <laughs> you know, and so, and so, you know, now we're all the way up back at the beginning, you know, right? We got to find. We're we're all tr- trying to find the balance in the middle. We're all, and if we can do this at a, at a higher level for each other, everything continues to improve. What what it, where it ends up getting getting crazy is when I my ego gets involved, and I think by some weird law of nature I deserve more than you. Like, oh. Okay, so so let, okay, ego getting involved. Um. How do I say this? My sovereignty, my agency, operating from my highest self is really important for me. And I do my best to not believing in my own bullshit in my mind, right? Mm-hmm. I, I do my best not to be um, shaken by external narratives. And so, what are some of the ways that you have to ensure that the ego doesn't get involved? How do you maintain this equanimity, right? Big word, this, this, mm-hmm. this groundedness, right? So you don't believe in your own hype yeah, and you don't believe in other people's hype about you. Okay. Well, it's being vigilant. You have to be vigilant because my ego is going to get involved. I am going to believe in my own hype and it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. The duration of that is is where it becomes concerning. It's like the duration. Happens, mm-hmm. Yeah. So if I believe it in my own hype for 15 seconds, mm-hmm. that, that might lead to a greater faith and a higher level of self-esteem and, and all that. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And then I find out whatever. But I got to feel good for a minute, so I'm going to keep on moving forward, feeling good. And and then getting back to the real life stuff of how am I treating you? Mm. I mean, the the great humility is is in socialization. It's like I don't got if as soon as I put the concern of my and responsibility of the impact I'm having on you, the ego has a very difficult time because it's it may go out it puts you before me. Mm. And so I, even though I have, you know, some other kind of distress in my life, I'm concerned with my kids or whatever, I can discipline myself to still treat you in a way that um, I want you to be treated Mm -hmm. based on the fact of how I feel about humanity. And and so um, it's important, but the ego, it's all discipline. It's all discipline, being committed to disciplining ourselves more than uh, validating ourselves. So, okay, I'm going to push that a bit, right? We use the right. dojo example as a uh, as a metaphor a lot. The way I see it, it's easy to be lovable. Sorry, it's easy to be loving to someone who's lovable, mm-hmm. right? And that's why the puppies, the, the babies always get all the love from everyone. But when someone, let's say, cut you off, cussing you off, like just staring you down, whatever, you know, treat you with disrespect and violence, that's the real test. That's the stress test, right? Mm -hmm. So in that moment, what do you do, Mitch? What do you teach other people do in those moments? For example, breathing or meditation or mantra or step away, get some space. I don't, whatever the thing is. What what, what we do, what we talk about at Man to Men Mm. is to become hypersensitive. Mm. Pay, in other words, be aware or pay attention to what the, what's actually occurring. It's like somebody cuts me off in the car. That Mm. was a, that was a experience that lasted you know, a 15th of a second. Mm -hmm. Adrenaline pumps up through my system. Pay extra attention. Be extra aware at that moment because what I realize now is they missed and I'm safe. Mm. And and, and all I have going on in my system is adrenaline now. Mm. But I I am consciously aware that I am secure. The threat has passed. It's over. And, and that's one of the big confusions I think we caused in the 70s and 80s, 60s, 70s, 80s, is we've confused the idea of being sensitive with the idea of being emotional. Mm. And, and so people pre- are pretending that they're sensitive and their ego is generating emotion after emotion after emotion. And they're not only causing damage emotionally to other people when they're doing it. Uh, They have no responsibility for the damage they're causing because the, you know, you can't judge their feelings. Can you? And, and feelings, emotions are just judgments. Okay. Before you go on to that one, Mm -hmm. this is an important point you're making. All right. Circling back to the truth about what happened in reality and the stories and interpretation and narratives that you make up in those moments, what Mitch is saying in those moments where you're triggered, become hyper aware of what actually happened versus getting involved in the stories of, you know, why did this person did this? And then the other mm-hmm. thing, the stories of your emotions. No, it's, 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 it's not getting involved with what happened because that's gone. Mm hmm. It's be, when you become extra alert, sensitive, paying attention, aware, whatever word we're going to use this decade, when you're really paying attention, the the, the threat has passed. Mm-hmm. And if you're going to live in the moment, the realization mm-hmm. is that there's no longer a threat occurring. Yep. And your emotions will be disciplined accordingly to your consciousness, not the story of what I just went through. I see. So... And okay. what it could have been and, and how it might have turned out different. It's like, yeah, yeah. no, no, I'm, I'm cruising what, at 55 again. What is actually happening right now, not what just happened. God. Yeah, and, we, and you hear it all the time, but we don't really elaborate, like be in the moment. Mm-hmm. 
people, if you're in the moment when the threat has passed or the thing that you're afraid of is, is no longer occurring, mm-hmm. the, you only have seconds to go before those feelings should change. Because yeah. in the moment, you're now aware of something else. And, and all of the emotional indulgence afterwards is all egotism. Yes. And then, uh, right, which is a great segue to uh, emotion. So what I'm hearing you say is being emotional, you're not saying to suppress your emotion. What you're saying is not to attach who you are with the emotions that are rising within. Is that correct? Um, no. You're not? I'm okay, so I mi- misunderstood. Saying, well, I'm actually saying you may, there are situations where you should suppress the emotions okay. because you can hurt people with them. Okay. You can, you can cause damage if your emotions are not disciplined. Correct. And, and, and your emotions are not happening in the moment. Okay. Your emotions are based on judgments from the past. Correct. If the past was five seconds ago or 50 years ago. Correct. And, and so if every time we get together and we're watching television and my favorite sports team is on and I'm yelling and screaming, being all emotional, what just happened in the last play, and you're sitting there, you know, trying to have some peace and quiet and watch the game. My emotions are harming you. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, They're causing distress in your life because here's this crazy person who's yelling at a screen. And, and so, um, to be, to suppress those emotions and realize, you know, consciously, like it's just a game. I'm not even on the field. They can't hear me when I'm cheering for them, which makes cheering at the TV screen, a kind of a useless activity. I like yelling at the, it's like, why are you yelling at the screen? Nobody gets it. You know, the, the refs are not intimidated by you yelling at your television. Yeah. This, this is a meta meta conversation. So uh, I, I'll share this real quick. A friend of mine who's very rational and, and yet he would put on, so he's very aware that he is, he has emotions, but he is not his emotions. However, he also loves to just yell at the screen or yell at, you know, the air because it's fun for him to do, even though he knows that he's not his emotions. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 I think, I think, I think venting is an important thing. Yeah. And socially, can I be considerate of the other people I'm around? If there's, if there's no one around, who cares? Right. Who cares? So well, what you're talking about is the footprint of your emotions, the emotional footprint that you have around. Am I going to be responsible for living in a society that I'm always impacting always and the impact that I'm having? That's what maturity and conscientiousness and stuff is. There's going to be results from me yelling Mm -hmm. or crying or whatever. Am I going to be like, if you and me get together and we go like, Hey man, let's go watch a game and yell at the television for a couple hours. Right. Then us going crazy is just fine. You know, have a couple beers, whatever we're gonna do, I, yell and scream. I, I, I would assert that's what the whole sporting, you know, uh industry is built around that. The whole collective consciousness of mm-hmm. yelling at teams together because it's fun to do. Yeah, and 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 I think that it has to be very these days it has to be very conscious. Mm. Like your friend, right? He knows he's not his feelings, but when he does this, he, he's very conscious that he's just yelling. Mm-hmm. And that energy that he's moving mm-hmm. is benefiting him somehow because he's obviously not dumb. Mm-hmm. And so he's not doing it because the fun is the relief. Yes. And, you and, get so, it. and so, he's, so, he's, so he's consciously taking care of himself by creating the situation. That's all good. But if I'm in an environment where there's like, you know, 10 or 20 people, it may not, I gotta, I gotta make sure that we're all on the same page. Yeah. Good point. That that's where like, you know, soccer stadium riots, you know, can just escalate really quickly. People when, getting beat up in parking yeah, lots. For, yeah. For stupid reasons. Cause they stop. They, 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 they think that the, the, the false rivalry is real. The reality yeah. is actually for fun. Ultimately, gonna, it comes, gonna, what, what it comes down to is for fun. Wear, right. I'm going to earn it because of what you're wearing. Yeah. 
this, this that, is that, dumb. That's a uh, emotional insanity. Yeah. Um, okay, a little segue. Can we go a little longer? Are you cool with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. So I know that you're also deeply in the, you know, the world of addiction, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're an expert. You, you, you've been a lecturer or a sponsor. Similar but slightly different flavor of being a sports coach is supporting others who's going through their awakening moment of finding their sovereignty around substance, whatever the substance is, right? Mm -hmm. So here's the nuanced question for you. How do you support someone with ruthless compassion while supporting them to claim responsibility? Does that make sense? So, yes, it makes, I think it makes sense. And maybe my answer will indicate that I understand. It may not. But um, it, should I, should I uh, contextualize ahead. a little bit before sure. you answer? Okay. So, what I meant is, in the world of addiction, and and then I and let me use the word addiction to you know in a very specific way. The way I define it, addiction is being controlled by the things that we don't necessarily want to do. So let's say eating sugar or watching TV or whatever the substance that you may overindulge too much, or anger or social media. So I, I use that term very very broadly. Not necessarily to just specific on substance, okay? So when as a coach, as a friend, as an advocate, as a mentor, whatever the role may be, you see someone addictive behavior and you want to, yes, give them compassion, not make them wrong, not beat them up for it. And at the same time, also support them, empower them to claim like, hey, you have the power to uh to not be controlled by this behavior right so mm -hmm. so, so 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 there's sovereignty there so how do you do both and you know ruthless compassion while supporting them to claim their sovereignty again so the i think the first um expression of sovereignty would be my own mm -hmm. so i am not going to let your addictive problem devastate my life mm -hmm. I'm, I'm i'm gonna maintain my life in a sovereign way that whatever it is that you are addicted to is not gonna leak over into my home my family my dog whatever mm -hmm. and i'm not gonna pay the price for what you're doing i'm gonna go for that assurance first if i mm -hmm. can't establish that then i need to retreat mm. let's say okay let me pause if I'm triggered by, you know, one's behavior, addictive behavior, if I feel like I have a messiah complex, I must, you know, go save this person. If if I can't hold my own agency around this, then I must retreat. That's what you say, yeah? Yes, I am. Great. And, Continue, and, please. And if, I, if, if I've established that well, then then we got to start getting conscious. We got to start raising our level of consciousness. Do they understand it as a problem, and why it's a problem? You know, most addictive behaviors come out as as behavioral problems in some area. They could be physical health, um, also. So, and but do they identify? If they don't identify it as a problem, or if they don't want to identify it as a problem, then I better retreat because I'm going to start using resources of time for somebody who doesn't want to have time doing that. They want to mm -hmm. go to the baseball game, not to the movies. It's like, mm -hmm. let me go to the baseball game, because when I'm going to the movies. Quick, quick pause there. Mm -hmm. So some might may argue, hey, if someone's drowning, do you save them, even though they didn't ask for the help? What do you say to that? I can't swim. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's a, that's a, swim, uh -huh. but, but I got to establish first. Yeah. It, it doesn't do any good if two of us drown. Yeah. So if I'm not an, an adept swimmer and I mean like close to, 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 uh, you know, coast guard level swimmer. Yeah. Me jumping in the water with somebody who's floundering 
is not really intelligent. Yeah. Okay. Assuming you do have that ability. If I have that ability. And then they're not asking for help. Do you jump in and help them? Even though they didn't ask for the help per se. If they're, but they're, if they're, uh, I, I, I don't think it's a fair analogy relational to addiction. It's but not? I don't How think come? so. How come? Um, because if you, if you jump in the water and you're not a swimmer and you're drowning, that's one thing. Okay. If you jump in the water and something happens while you're in the water and you begin to drown, Mm-hmm. Um, then that person may be willing to be helped. Most of them are panicking, so so you got to be able to endure their panic to 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 what they right. relax right, right, right. Yeah, for the yeah, help. Yeah. Mm-hmm. An addiction, uh, which is always self induced, whether mm-hmm. they're responsible for the fact that they're doing that or not, is like, and and are they willing to take responsibility for? Are they drowning? Right. Do you know you're addicted to this? Are you okay? with Is the comfort of your addiction so beneficial to you that you want to maintain it? Mm-hmm. Most addicts for an extended period of time, they're okay with their addiction. Mm-hmm. Many of them, alcoholics, will tell you that they're alcoholic. Mm-hmm. But it's not causing them enough problem, them enough problem. So we're back to the sovereignty thing, right? It's not causing them enough problem to want to address it because I'm only want them to address it because how it affects me. It's like, I don't want to see them suffer. I don't want to see them die younger. I don't want to see them go through the things, the final progressions of addiction. I don't mm-hmm. want to watch it. So mm-hmm. I want to help them so that, so that they can be helped. And, and it's kind of a both end, not an either or thing. Mm-hmm. So, so then what am I going to do? Well, let them have their sovereignty. Mm-hmm. Not participate, not intrude upon their sovereignty mm-hmm. under the guise of being compassionate. Yep. Because because compassion these days is a, is a very easy thing for the ego to attach. Yep. You can weaponize it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. And what you're really being is is uh, abusive or oppressive. That's right. I'm gonna fix you. That's right. Just Pretending that- to be compassionate. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and and a lot of people who I of what I don't know so much this year, this year, but last year, you know, a lot of people were were joyfully identifying themselves as empaths, mm-hmm. which is a psychological disorder. <laughs> it's a strong, strong statement. Go for it. It's, it's in the manual. Okay. It's in the psychological manual of disorders because okay. the delusion is that I can feel your feelings for you. Mm. I know what you're feeling, even though deeper, maybe than even you do. Mm. And it's like, well, that might be possible, but you know, the number of people I was hearing do say that it's not possible with that for that many people. Mm-hmm. But it became a, a herd mentality. You know, that the, they're validating their egos for being more sensitive to others than other people were. Yeah, they're projecting. And what they basically were were doing was, you know, deciding that they got to tell other people how they should live their lives. So be mm-hmm. very careful not to do that with addicts because mm-hmm. they're going to defy you anyway. One of the hallmarks of all addicts is that they're very defiant. You tell mm-hmm. them blue, they say green. You say pain, they say pleasure. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's not killing me. Well, but you're dying, but it's not killing me. They'll argue the opposite because they're just defiant. So you go in there and you want to maintain your own sovereignty first, right? Well, you got to also have the compassion to let them. Compassion means with pain, Mm -hmm. not having their pain for them. Mm -hmm. Maintaining your own sovereignty allows you to be compassionate. But if they don't want help, they don't want help. So uh, let me help you. Answer is no. Oh, okay. So... A nuanced question there. Let's say you're relating to them. You're their best friend. You're their son. You're their father. Whatever the case may be, right? You mm-hmm. care deeply about them. I think the challenge there is you watch them spiral down, right? And say something. Eventually, they, you know, did end their life or whatever the reason. And there's certain guilt. Did I do enough? Could I have done more? There's that unanswerable question. Uh, 
I don't have personal experience with it, but I can empathize per se. Well, I can mm -hmm. sympathize rather. That's yeah. a more precise word. So how do you then, you know, you get your ego out of it. Okay. To be guilty is your ego's involved. Mm. You're making their situation about yourself. Mm, mm, mm. It's like, oh no, how do I make that? They're dying about me. I'll feel guilty. Mm, well, mm, am mm, I? Mm, mm, mm. No, I'm not. And and one because one of the things I think we got going on, and it's very common, is we don't really understand compassion. Compassion mm. does not mean be involved. Compassion is to be to be you can be in the presence of it, but you're not involved with it. I see that you're in pain. I see that you're suffering. I can sit there while you suffer, but I'm not going to suffer for you. Mm -hmm. And then there we end it. And then there's your sovereignty again. Mm -hmm. He's like, I'm not going to suffer for you. I'm not going to let your your addictions cause me suffering. It's like, you go ahead, bro. <laughs> I'm, right here. I'm right here. But because the one of the one of the tricks that happens in codependency and and, and those kind of things is we have been convinced with by the misuse of things like compassion and sympathy and empathy and all of that, that we need to understand illness. That's what we're convinced of. That somehow if I just understand how sick you are, I'm going to be able to help you not be sick anymore. I don't understand that. So can you say some more about so, that? So one of the one of the traps that that addicts and alcoholics and people that are addicted is they're chronic complainers and they're filled with self pity. Mm -hmm. And we sympathize with their complaints because we're because we're human. Mm -hmm. and, Hence and my question about right um, encouraging them for sovereignty at the same time ruthless compassion. Maintaining nice. your own sovereignty, mm -hmm. and and I mean the ruthless part, the which is merciless, mm -hmm. is what is without mercy. I'm going to be compassionate, so I will sit with you while you die. I'm not going to die with you, mm -hmm. and I am compassionate enough to sit with you all the way to the death, instead of intrude upon your sovereignty. I'm not going to call the ambulance. I'm not going to call the police to come take you to the nut house. I'm just going to be with you. Mm. If I have another, a different level of empathy, I might call the police and have them arrest the guy and take him to the nut house to detox him or whatever. But the, the, we have a kind of a misunderstanding of compassion. It doesn't take a lot of action. And especially if the other person isn't going to take responsibility for taking the action. Because, mm. because the transition that has to happen, this is very unpopular in the recovery arenas, okay? Because mm. they're so self-centered. Mm -hmm. They're so filled with selfishness and, and everything else. It's like their job is to relate to health, not demand that everybody relates to their illness. And they're Say, the la Say the last sentence again. I didn't understand. One not demand that everybody relates to their illness. Mm -hmm. A relationship will health with health will take you out of just about every illness, addiction or not. Right, right. Even if you don't understand the illness, mm -hmm. if you understand health, you can do things that are healthy. It's like there's there's a lot of cancer treatments that are. Here's what health is. We're going to give you this kind of food. We're going to give you this kind of blah, blah, blah. We're going to take away these stressors. And you're going to live, have a healthy environment. Mm. And, and all of a sudden, they quit producing cancer cells. Mm -hmm. By identifying health and conducting self within the limitations of health. An addict is a person who can't tell themselves no. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they can do all the healthy things, but then they do all this other stuff with the healthy things that causes them problems. Lack of discipline. To, because it takes discipline to stay within the parameters of health. I wouldn't be overweight if I could stay within the parameters of health. I wouldn't be overweight. wouldn't happen. But I'm overweight. 
because I don't stay within the, I just don't blame you for it. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't blame the grocery store that I walk into. I take responsibility for my own lack of discipline. And I continue to try to discipline myself because that's what a, that's what a diet to lose weight is. It's self-discipline. Mm-hmm. We, we want to, we want to get into this, all this trickery and powders and potions and things to the new special diet. Well, the new special diet is the same diet it's always been. Eat some greens, drink some water, get not too much protein, just enough. Understand health and do the healthy thing. And your body mm-hmm. will come back like we're back to the beginning of the show, right? Mm-hmm. We'll come back into balance. Like, yep. Oh. But it's by understanding health that we do it, not adding 10,000 years of, of talking about the addiction. Um, one last question. So we've been, and this is, this may be a big one. This be me whole conversation, right? We've been talking about sovereignty. What are we sovereign of agency in my mind is being able to own my decisions I'm making between the space between stimulus and response and in that space, pick the options through my own choice rather than my addiction right to whatever mm-hmm. the thing is and that's what we've been talking about we also have alluded to the importance of surrounding yourself with people that you trust in your case man to man right to mm-hmm. have a, 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 an environment a community that you can trust them to um rely on the trustworthiness i think the, the phrase was while you're ego falls apart, your life doesn't fall apart because you have a community to support you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, if I just look at those two points, it's a little paradoxical, right? Because at the one hand, we're saying trust your own higher self, cultivate mm-hmm. the skills to do that. On the other, we're also saying trust your environment, listen to your one of the teachings of the men's group that we're in is trust your men or right? trust your circle. Mm-hmm. So one last thing I'll say, then I'll ask you the question is there is an African phrase or African word Ubuntu. It says that I am that you are. So who you are is a reflection of who I am. And I thought that was a beautiful way to articulate that. So could you address the, the, seemingly paradoxical statement that we're making here. Yes, I'm going to say it. I'm going to overly simplify it, but it's exact, but I think it's accurate. Mm -hmm. Spiritual practice. Okay. So the ability between this one side to the other side, the higher self, lower self, however we're going to reference it Mm -hmm. uh, is what is the practice that we're tending to in the meantime? Are we continually identifying ourselves over here or over there? But in the middle of that is the spiritual practice. Like uh, you said, you you lean in the way of the Tao. Mm -hmm. And you look for the middle. Mm -hmm. Well, well, the meditation that uh, gets you to the middle, you don't start in the middle. You, You have a spiritual practice that reconciles the aspects involved and you end up in the middle. It's a result of a practice. Mm-hmm. And that's and that's all we're talking about. It's like the the truth of addiction and the truth of health, and you sit there and you start reconciling and reconciling is the spiritual practice. How do I reconcile the conflict caused by addiction with the uh, I'll say ecstasy of health? Mm-hmm. It's like so so it's a, it's and it's a, they're on two different lines. The vertical line is ecstatic and serenity. Mm-hmm. top is ecstasy the the bottom is serenity the addiction line is adrenaline and satiation mm-hmm. i'm either going too fast and how i treat my going too fast is i go too slow i go to a treatment program and i sit still i've been on i've been on crank for you know six years and been doing too many too much crystal meth and now i'm going to go over here and i'm going to sit around well you're still on the addictive path because the spiritual pr- practice that's in the middle of the addictive path is about serenity and ecstasy. And so it's it's the vertical path. Mm. 
to continue the metaphor, you know, forward, right? You're going, you're going up and down vertically. You're not going side to side. And, and therefore, like uh, in your meditation of the Tao, you, you're staying, you stay in the middle. And instead of um, trying to, trying to deal with the opposites. Because because the the addictive path is filled with opposites. It's the duality, mm. and and so the center of that is a is a different is the ascendant path, or the transcendent or the transformative path, mm -hmm. and it, and it all sums up in everything we now we're and here we are. We have summed it up the the whole day. We have summed mm -hmm. up two hours now, with the trans with the transformation of of the spiritual practice that one takes. So whether it be your morning, afternoon, nightly meditation, or your prayer service, or your Sunday church, or your Saturday synagogue, or whatever it's going to be. Um, if you have that in place, you have a chance. Be because there's a, there's a, a human quality that is very difficult with the kind of egos we have. It's very difficult to access. And it's probably the most important one in the sum total of everything we're talking about it's sincerity mm. we can we can get emotional about our causes and our things and the dramas and the and the victories and we can get all emotional about that but what what's really important to us what is the what is the aspect of our life that we find to be the most valuable because that's what is important to commit to. You commit to the to the path. You commit to the practice. The path is going to wander. And but if you commit to the practice, all these things that we're talking about, in a much more interesting way, uh, is is all accessible to us. We can we can we can make the journey. But it but it has to do with the commitment to that spiritual practice. And, and, you know, these days there's a, there's a bunch of them. And, and my only recommendation around that is pick one. So, so if you're going to be, if you're going to be that, if you're going to be Jewish, be Jewish hundred percent. If you're going to be Christian, be Christian hundred percent. If you're going to practice the Tao, a hundred percent commit. That means you don't get to change your mind mm. when it gets inconvenient and it gets to stressful and it's the wrong time of day and there's someplace else you'd rather be practice your commitment. Mm. It's like, Oh, that's not fun. It's not fun. It's serene, but it's not fun. And you know, and I'm, I'm a person who I live on a high level of need for entertainment. My mind mm. operates so fast. I like to indulge it. And, and some of the spiritual practices I have personally are, they don't do that. They're, they're about being still. And so in an active society like we have, having a spiritual practice of some kind where we can ha find that stillness within gives us the consciousness we need to do all these other things we've talked about for the last two hours. Yeah. It's very, it's very challenging because entertainment is a big deal. I don't know how you experience it, but I, I mean, I like being entertained. I like being fascinated. I like being intrigued. Yes. I like all that stuff. Yes. It's like, oh, it's really distracting and, and it makes you vulnerable to sickness. Yes. Um, one last question, Mitch. This is actually uh, poignant. Um, and as an addiction specialist, I, I'm so curious to know your response. So if needing more and more of something while getting less and less enjoyment satisfaction is called addiction, what does needing less and less of something while getting more and more joy and satisfaction call? Consciousness. Consciousness. Hmm. Beautifully said. The world is a great place. The trees are beautiful. The ducks are fine. You know what I mean? The fish are cool. All the other things that run around on the trees and the ants are pretty bitching. All that stuff is cool if you'll pay attention to it. 
Mm-hmm. That takes consciousness. Yes. And, and when they call for our consciousness, we shush it away. We wash the ants off our sandwiches and stuff rather than admire them, respect them, enjoy yes. them. Yes. It's like appreciation. So I guess with that consciousness, you'd have to say more than that. But really, consciousness. Appreciate what, what it is that's right in front of you in this moment. Yes. Uh, one realization, real quick share. One realization that I had uh, just a couple of weekends ago, you know, with the war going on, I was deep in my meditation. And I thought about noble warrior. I'm pro peace kind of a guy, right? Mm-hmm. So who am I or what am I actually warring against? Why did I name noble warrior? The answer that came to me was oblivion, lack of clarity, chaos, confusion. That's the war and Clarity, consciousness is the effort that I'm putting forth to move towards that direction. So that's, I think, beautifully said. It's it's uh, very much aligned with mm-hmm. the mission of Noble Warrior. Very cool. Yeah. Mitch. And here, we, and here we are. Yes, here we are. I just want to take a moment, just uh, really thank you for sharing your life story and you know, your life's work really, because you've been in this work for the last 30 years around addiction, young men's work, men's work. And uh, it's very obvious for anyone who listens to you, how passionate you are, how much you believe in the the work that you do. And it was, as we mentioned earlier, I'm planting a seed, I'm planting it publicly. You know, I want to see your voice gets amplified even more so. So, you know, perhaps starting a podcast and highlighting, you know, men doing great things in the world, I think would be a a great contribution to the cause, the movement that you are on. So thank you so much for being here, Mitch. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, and it really is a testament to believing in nature, believe in humanity, believe that it's all been made for good. None of this is a mistake. We're just distracted. Mm. And so becoming conscious so that we can be aware of all of the beauty in each other and, and all that around us is, is, is the calling. Mm-hmm. It's like, pay attention. It's like, it is an awesome world we live in. Nature did its job. It's a, we're in good shape. And so let's just pay attention. Absolutely. Then I get to be on the middle road. Yes, yes. And for those that want to follow you, who resonates with your voice, with your energy, with the way you look, uh, with your style, with your voice, where do they go? Uh, Man2men.org. Okay. M-A-N hyphen T-O hyphen M-E-N is the the best place to go. Awesome. All right, guys. Have a good rest of the day. Be well. Cheers.